Our next reading is part two of Kant's essay on the common saying uh, that may be correct in theory, but it's no use in practice. So uh, the lecture is going to cover what is this essay, because we're not reading part one. Uh, then it's going to talk about Hobbes, then it's going to talk about Kant's political philosophy overall. So first, what is this essay? Uh, uh, the title makes it sound like it's going to be about this objection, you know, the common saying that's perfectly fine in theory, but it's no use in practice. That's kind of what part one is about. Kant responds to some objections to his moral theory that it's fine in theory, but no good in practice. Uh, we're not reading part one because we don't care about his moral theory. We're only reading parts two and three. Right now we're reading part two. Eventually we're reading part three. Part two we're reading because it's basically a really short summary of his political philosophy. So what we're going to spend most of the rest of the semester on gets summarized in this section of this essay. And then part three is a good summary of some of the things that he says in the rest of his political philosophy. So we'll read that later. But so uh, read part two as a sort of preview of what's coming, as a sort of uh, condensed summary of what's coming. Because what's coming is relatively long and because this essay is pretty short, it's going to be hard to understand. So he's going to throw a lot of stuff at you. It's a sort of summary of his entire philosophical system. And so it's going to be difficult uh, to get all the details, but that's fine. This is just to sort of give you a taste of what's coming so that when you see it in much more detail later, when we go into the metaphysics and morals, you'll be able to sort of think back like, oh, I saw a preview of this when I read part two uh, on the relation of theory to practice in the right of a state. So uh, this will be a difficult reading, but it will give you a sort of map, a picture of what's coming and set you up uh, so you're in a good position going forward. You'll notice uh, after he introduces part two on the relation of theory to practice in the right of a state, he says parentheses against Hobbes. So uh, Kant is responding to all sorts of people in his political philosophy, but the sort of the three main people he has in mind here are Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau. Hobbes is uh, the subject of this essay, although not very explicitly. He only comes up once explicitly later in the essay. And so I'm going to give you a quick summary of Hobbes. Uh, maybe at some point in these lectures, I haven't recorded the next lectures yet, I might eventually summarize Locke and Rousseau or one or the other, um, but it's going to be good to have Hobbes uh, as the sort of main foil against which Kant is developing his theory because Hobbes is one of the most important predecessors. So what did Hobbes have in mind? So Hobbes had a social contract theory of the state. And what that means is uh, we're trying to figure out why do people have an obligation to follow the law? What gives a ruler the right to rule? What gives states control over the territory that they rule? Uh, what is the foundation of the state? What is the sort of foundation of politics? And Hobbes's answer is that it's a contract. The state has a right to rule. The ruler has a right to rule because the citizens have sort of, in effect, signed a contract. Specifically, what they've done is they've come together and they've all agreed to give up their rights to the sovereign. So whoever is in charge, they give it up to the king or they give it up to the government or something. And then because they've given up their rights to the government, the government now has the power to tell the people what to do. This can happen through literally signing a contract. You can all get together one day and sign a contract that says we're going to give all our rights to the sovereign. Or it can happen uh, by sort of uh, submitting, like when you're conquered in war and you say, okay, I give up my rights to you uh, so that you don't kill me. Uh, so there's various ways that you can sort of end up subject to this contract. But basically the thought is you come together and you sign a contract. Why would you do this? Why would you ever sign your rights away to the sovereign? Hobbes thought you basically have two options. You can live in a state of nature where there's no ruler, there's no state. Uh, it's just everyone for themselves. Or you can live in the political condition under a sovereign. And the state of nature, Hobbes thought, is just terrible. There's nobody enforcing any sort of law. And so it's basically everybody against everybody else in a fight for survival. Some people, uh, you, you sort of need to fight with people to get the resources you need to survive. 
And even if there are enough resources to go around for everybody, some people are just jerks and they're going to come steal your stuff and attack you and kill you just because they want to. And so to protect yourself from them, you have to have enough resources to keep yourself safe. And to do that, you'll have to take from other people and to protect themselves from you, they're going to have to. And so it's just it's just a mess. Nothing productive happens. Uh, he famously says, life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so the thought is, that's that's just a mess. Nobody wants that. It's completely irrational to live in the state of nature. And so basically human reason tells us that the only rational thing to do is to come together and form a state. You contract with other people to create the sovereign. And the sovereign will protect you. Even if it's a crummy sovereign, even if it's a bad king, it's still going to be much, much better than the state of nature. So no matter what kind of government you're going to create, no matter what kind of government you end up, that's going to be much better than the state of nature, Hobbes thinks. So that's Hobbes's picture of politics. It's kind of a grim picture, but the thought is we sort of all rationally contract to create the state. And because of that, the state has a right to rule over us. So that is one of the main views of the state, one of the main views of politics to which Kant is responding. How does Kant respond? Like, how is Kant different from Hobbes? Well, Kant is different from Hobbes in lots of ways. We see a very quick preview of this in this essay because uh, Kant sort of elaborates his entire political philosophy here. His three main breaks with Hobbes are he has a different conception of freedom than Hobbes. He has a different conception of equality than Hobbes. He has a different uh, conception of what it is to be an independent citizen of the state than Hobbes does. We'll get an outline of Kant's views of these. If you want, we can talk about Hobbes's views of these, but we don't really have to uh, worry about that too much. But uh, these three ideas, freedom, equality, independence, and then the fourth, uh, the sort of social contract or the social compact uh, or the civil constitution, uh, we also see Kant's views of this. So these kind of four things, these three ideas, plus the idea of the social contract, keep track of those. And then uh, just to have something concrete to look at, uh, we can find the one place where he mentions Hobbes by name. Uh, so uh, after Kant has explained much of his political philosophy, uh, he suggests that, uh, look, people have inalienable rights against the head of state, um, although these cannot be coercive rights. So you'll sort of see how we get there, uh, both in this essay and then later as we read the rest of Kant. So he says people have rights against the state, and then, but he notes Hobbes is of the opposite opinion. According to him, a head of state has no obligation to the people by the contract and cannot do a citizen any wrong. He may make what arrangements he wants about him. So uh, why is this? Well, you can sort of basically imagine for Hobbes, you give up your rights to the state, you sign the contract and you give up your rights, and now the sovereign can do whatever they want. So they have the right to do whatever they want to you. So they have no obligation to any of the citizens to do any sort of thing. The sovereign is just completely in charge. And Kant is saying, no, uh, that's not how it works. <laughs> Stated so generally, the proposition is appalling. He thinks that's absolutely ridiculous. The state cannot have sort of complete right to do whatever it wants to its citizens. Citizens have inalienable rights against the head of the state. So that's one of the many ways in which Kant differs from Hobbes. We'll see the rest both in this essay and in the rest of the course. Uh, but that's a sort of, that's one initial thing to start thinking about in terms of what kind of state does Kant defend? What kind of view of political philosophy does he have in, uh, in his whole system?